Welcome back, everyone. Kevin Carpenter. I'm here with Asaf. We're going to talk about the uh, C++ Under the Hood class that he's teaching this year. It's a pre-conference class, and he's giving a talk. And yeah, I'm excited because, Asaf, I, I've never got to do an interview with you, so I appreciate I really appreciate you taking the time today. How's it going? Fine. Um, looking forward to the interview. So Asaf has been, you've been, I was looking at your LinkedIn. I mean, to say 30 years of experience is kind of putting it mildly. And it looks like you've been in doing instructing for, we'll say for X years. Why, well, you know, and you can fill in some more of that. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, my, my LinkedIn is a mess because my professional life is interesting. Um, yep. I'll try to cover it from like a 100,000 feet altitude. Um, developer for 15 years, started with C++, but then also worked with other, uh, I call them C asterisk languages like uh, C Sharp, Java. And um, after 15 years, I realized that I've been working for uh, more than 10 companies and yep. I'm getting bored. Um, yeah, that's an insight that took me 15 years to, to realize. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I started soul searching and tried all kinds of things. And uh, I realized that I'm doing a 360 and I'm um, yep. back to the same place. But now I am a freelancer. Uh, I have consultant written on my forehead, which means that uh, I'm not switching jobs. I'm switching projects and it's fine. <laughs> and um uh, during the soul searching, a friend came along and said, uh, do you want to teach a course in programming? And I said, sure, why not? I'll try anything. Yeah. And um, I loved it. And the students didn't complain too much. So I've been doing it ever since. My first courses were C++. Yep. And then also C Sharp, Java, design patterns, architecture, all this stuff. And um, about the 30, and, and I've been doing it for 15 years now. Mm -hmm. um, 30, nice. So it's it's 30 years, almost 31 years in, in total. Yeah. Uh, so of all the stuff that you do, um, I do notice, you know, you, were, you one of your hobbies that you have, you you volunteer as a um, as a judge for the robotics group yeah, too. Right. That's, that's first, for, right? Uh, uh, for uh, first, first robotics competition, FRC, and I've been doing that since uh, 2008. And uh, I always have, here we go, I always have something <laughs> from there. So this is from two years ago, I think. Um, they that looks like the... That looks like the perfect cube to throw around at people. Like, you know, you're answering the question next. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll bring that to my class. Good idea. <laughs> Great idea. So your class is practical approaches for writing safer C++. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's your talk. Look at me. Yeah, I, I have a talk and I have yeah. a class. And um, we'll get I to the talk and get mixed up. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting. We'll get to the talk in a few minutes, but um, because when I think about that, so C++ under the hood. And yeah. so everything that happens when we hit build, right? I mean, right. yeah. And so how does that help developers? Give me your insight of why you think that helps developers. Well, um, first, I mean, there are some things that are anecdotes. For example, the fact that uh, the stack doesn't exist and uh, mm -hmm. he is a figment of your imagination because yep. the standard doesn't say anything about either stack or heap. Right. Um, but that's, that's esoteric. Um, it, more interesting things is that you can't count on certain things that you learn to rely on mm -hmm. when you're uh, compiling or uh, running your code or debugging it. And on the other hand, if you know a few things, then you might be a better debugger right. because of it. Um, yeah. I released a short video, a, a teaser uh, for a CVP con about uh, uninitialized variables. You know, mm -hmm. they're supposed to contain garbage, which is yep. actually uh, whatever was there before uh, we allocated this uh, piece of memory. 
but if you take a look uh, using some of the debuggers in the market today, you'll realize that this uh, supposedly random bits is not random at all. And okay. there is a reason for that. Yeah. And um, if you know that reason, you can rely on it to be random or not random. Or the fact that the stack, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist, but the stack that does exist, on most systems, it goes backwards. So if you have int i and then int j, the address yep. of i will be after j, which is a useful thing to know when you're debugging and you, you don't want to be you know, astonished by this fact. And so when I was looking at your at the class description, you're going to use Visual Studio Code a lot, or excuse me, Visual Studio, Visual not Visual Studio, Studio Code. Yeah. Visual Studio. And so I do think it's interesting because I I'm lucky enough that I get to cross both sides of the fence in a day. So I do a lot of Visual Studio Code in Linux, you know, or Visual Studio Code with Unix base because Mac as well. But then mm -hmm. I use Visual Studio for a Windows application. And it is kind of funny watching the debugger in C++ because this is a massive MFC app. And watching the, you know, you're stepping through and, and literally the debugger's showing it going backwards as it's going through a struct. Now, I mm -hmm. don't think that that directly correlates to what you're saying for how things are organized, but... I do think it's interesting when we watch things jump around in the debugger. And it sounds like, you know, one of the things I can get if I take your class is more of that underlying framework understanding of why some things might be happening the way they happen. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I like using Visual Studio for teaching because, as the name suggests, it is visual. It has lots of things I can show instead of just yep. telling you about the stack, I can actually show you the bits. Um, yeah. And it's uh, pretty easy to, to handle, even for uh, people not familiar with it. So my students are also encouraged to use that, at least during the classes. Yeah. And um, uh, we're going to even dive into uh, assembly. Okay. Uh, bring your valve bags, by the way. Uh, yeah. We're, we're going to look at assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's part of what you're saying because C++ is nice, but actually what happens, what really happens is that we're running uh, opcodes. So right. we need to be aware of that. And, and also then, about that. And that makes sense. And I was going to say that kind of makes me think of when they talk about C++ and the onion concept, just kind of the layers that you have, whether, you know, from the source code to the build to the linking and everything else. But it seems to me that yours is going to be more about when we're getting to that binary that's being processed than anything that's happening in the build process or linking. Is that a fair statement that yours is kind of going from the source code to how it is running on the metal, if we will, and being able to look at the tools that you can use to see that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, as I said, we, we're going to look at the um, code and assembly mm -hmm. generated from it. We yep. are going to look at the memory, uh, memory layout and uh, parts of memory segment like the stack and heap. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to look at the build process at the preprocessor, compiler, linker, and uh, how do we see, for example, how can I see what the compiler sees? Because I see files, but the compiler only see one unit for, for compiling. Um, so we'll be able to take the compiler uh, point of view. Um, so yeah, we'll do running, like runtime stuff. We'll do compile time stuff. We'll do edit stuff. Um, yeah, it's going to be a full day. Very cool. So I'm going to, I want to, now I'm going to jump around a little bit just because now this has got my mind going on a couple spots. So I want to go to your, uh, your, is a C++ inherently, you know, risky kind of an idea with, with your talk. And so, so the first question I kind of had was, you know, um, cause I was talking with Andreas Fertisch who's doing a, he's doing a class as well. That's on embedded and it brought up MRSA. And so, you know, whenever I think of MRSA, you know, generally I just think plain embedded space, but you mention it in your talk description, which makes me want to say, do you think MRSA as, as a framework is good for all C++ projects? Or, you know, do you think it still lives mainly in that embedded space? 
Okay, so uh, that's a great question. Um, and I have a whole lecture about us programmers uh, not being paid to write more code, but to produce mm -hmm. working quality software. Okay. And uh, if you want to write more code, then go ahead and type away. But yeah. if your goal is to write good quality software, it means that you sometimes have to slow down in order not to repeat yourself and go back and debug and get the customer yelling at you because the code crashed or whatever. Uh, so we'll need some guardrails because the language obviously doesn't provide us with enough guardrails. And the one it provides, uh, for example, not allowing you to assign to a const, it then right. takes away by giving you a const cast. Right. That's wonderful. So um, we need something from the outside. And... Um, Things like uh, solid and design patterns and uh, clean code and all these are nice, mm -hmm. but we need like more strict things. Uh, for example, um, when I was—I mean, it feels like when I was in kindergarten because it was so long ago. Um, my teacher told me never use go to. Okay? Yes, your people did that too. Yep, yep. Uh, never and, use go to. Yeah, as, and I never used GoTo except in classes to write, uh, to show them what not to do. Right. And um, it's it's not such a burden not to use GoTo, but right. it makes your code more structured, right? Less mm -hmm. prone to errors, problems with the allocation and uh, um, destructors and whatnot. Uh, so this is just a one tiny example of how following certain rules will make yeah. you a better programmer and make your code better. I And so I understand what you're saying there, because I kind of think about it too. Um, one of my big learning experiences over the years has been test-driven development. Now, I am mm -hmm. not incredibly good at TDD, um, even with all the time that I spend with Phil Nash. Um, but I will say that it did, you know, I used to not understand the issues of tightly coupling. You know, I think when mm -hmm. I was earlier in my career, I would naturally write code that was more tightly coupled, not really understanding that I was doing that. But as soon as you then need to turn around and you start learning TDD, just the knowledge of having to separate and write a test case will, at least for me, help me suddenly see, oh, so this is what tightly coupling looks like. This is what the problem it causes. This is what ends up coming out of that. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to what you're saying there um, from, you know, having those extra guardrails to help us work and think better as programmers. But I want to finish with one other question. So modern C++, you know, if we are coding in, and let me just go, I'll pick a standard, like 17 forward. If we're, if we're really writing modern C++ from a 17 forward, you know, so you're not using raw pointers, you're using a lot of the standard library. Do you, do you still think if we're doing that as a base that C++ is still as inherently unsafe as it was? Um. C++, um, modern C++, C++ 11 onward, actually, yeah, it, it makes C++ much safer or optionally makes C++ Option. safer because you can use uh, smart pointers and all these things and never use the new again. Yeah. Uh, but that's just one part of the, of the, of the problem. Equation, there right? are <laughs> many other problems. Um, you can still forget uh, the default in uh, switch case. Yep. In modern yep. C++. And um, you can still use, because C++, um, how did Scott Mayers uh, put it once? Um, C++, he used to hear all the time that C++ is a language with its future in front of it. Most of C++ code wasn't written yet. And right. he said that, I didn't hear that in, in a very long time. And he said that before he quit, before uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. C++ has lots of baggage, lots of legacy code, and that yeah. code uses new. And that code might be using GoTo. And that code, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, right. Okay, so we need to be able to work with old code. We need to be able yes. with people thinking with old code. I yeah. know people who are still working with the CPP uh, 98. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so they're not modern. <laughs> They're yeah. writing new. I think, I, I hope they're not using malloc. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? Yes. So, yeah, we we all need uh, to to have more guardrails, I think, to, to help us write better code. And it's, it's not a shame. It's not like, you know, um, a, a grown-up um, uh, riding a, a tricycle, a kid's tricycle, to be safer, okay? Right. We're grown-ups, it's okay, um, but still, if we can ride um, our C++ with, with some guardrails, I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. Well, I wanna say thank you for taking the time this evening for you, morning for me, um, Asaf, and if you haven't already and you need to understand more what's under the hood of your C++, then you want to head on over to registration, sign up for C++ under the hood with Asaf. Uh, that'll be running on Sunday, September 14th. And I'm a little jealous, but not because he has inherently safe practical approaches to writing C++, safer C++ on Monday. So he gets to one shot his week and enjoy the rest of the conference after Sunday and Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get to wait till later in the week, but I do look forward to, you know, I'm going to catch you because I want to talk about uh, some memory stuff because uh, my talk will be a back to basics about memory allocators later in the week. And so... I look forward to seeing you in the halls at the Gaylord uh, in, wow, I think under four weeks now. Yeah. Yeah. It's a month from now. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So uh, I'll see you there in Aurora. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. -bye. See ya.